Hi, I'm Dave Bryant, and uh, for our latest segment here with our Ornette Primetime Oral History on our Third Thursdays concerts, our guest tonight is Mr. Fred Williams, who was a bassist in kind of an early proto-primetime, the group with uh, James Blood Omer and Ronald Shannon Jackson and Vern Nix and uh, Donardo. And uh, I first met Fred and played with him, we figured, 43 years ago at Berkeley uh, in an ensemble class I was taking, and the regular bass player couldn't make it. And uh, the drummer brought in a sub who turned out to be Fred. And uh, um, he didn't seem to be doing anything unusual, just walking four on the floor, and we're playing our usual tunes, and sitting there comping, and I'm thinking, well, the drummer sounds good today. I could go on. Like, yeah, this, uh, you know, the tempos are really solid today. The rhythm section feels good today. <laughs> so you can see where this is going. Mm -hmm. And I finally start thinking, maybe it's a bass player. Because there's a thing, you know, that a good bass player can do very subtly without doing anything fancy. Just seems to bring the rhythm section together. Seems to give the whole band a little lift. And uh, it definitely happened that day. So Fred packed up his bass and left the end of the class. And the drummer said, yeah, that bass player, man, he's great. He says, with a guy like that, you feel like you can do anything. And he said, uh, yeah, that guy used to play with Ornette Coleman. And for me, I did, my, my main man, piano teacher, Bruce Thomas, that had uh, played with Ornette, uh, w encouraged me to study with him and so forth. But before then, this was the first contact I'd had with somebody that had been in that kind of proximity with Ornette. And to think I had just played with him, that was only two degrees of separation right there. And I thought, oh, this is, this is fabulous. This is, this is why I came up north. This is, this is burning. So I almost chased you down the hall that day and said, you know, what's going on? But 43 years later, what's going on, Fred? Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you uh, again. Uh, it's a pleasure, a pleasure. Only difference is I'm sure you don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> they had so many ensembles yeah, that I yeah. played with. Dixieland, yeah. this one, that one. I, I really don't remember. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. It, it was a red letter day for me, though. And... Um, so Fred and I reconnected on Facebook a few years back, and so I'd been saying, Fred, something comes up, I want to get us together. So I'm so glad we got a chance to do this. Um, so um, I think uh, starting off, maybe let's talk about, I know you wanted to uh, talk about your father's career, mm -hmm. who had uh, a very accomplished musician in New York. Yes, yeah, tell us about him. Yeah, well, my father had a, um a band in New York City in the 50s and the 60s. It was called the Ohaldo Williams Latin Jazz Calypso Orchestra. And I was only about six years old, and they used to do a lot of dance hall music. And one day he brought home a little record player, you know, the one with the needle sticking down. Yeah. And he gave me a bunch of records, and one of them was um, The Empty Foxhole by Arnett Coleman. And I said, well, Daddy, what kind of music this is? The Daddy said, they have all kind of music in this world. So just listen to all of them. <laughs> and then about 28 years late, no, about 18 years later, I had the opportunity to play with Mr. Coleman. Right, right. So we were talking about your storied career, all the other folks you played with, Lester Bowie, Arthur Blythe, a lot of people. Uh, but uh, you came to Ornette through uh, knowing James Blood Omer. Exactly. Right, right. So and how was it, how did you come in contact with Blood? Well, I was, I was going to Berkeley, and they had some kind of break, spring break, whatever, it was so long ago, but it was a break from school, and my, my roommate, Alan Burroughs, he played a, a record with, with Joe Henderson, and he said, listen to the guitar player, and I said, I don't hear nothing, and he played it over and over, I heard about three, four notes. He said, those are magic notes. We have to find this guy. So we went to New York on the break, 
he found him, you know, on the loft on 6th Street. And, um, you know, we went in and Alan played his guitar, I played my bass, yeah. and blood came straight out. He said, Fred, Berkeley's building is going to be there, but you have an opportunity. You can go back to school anytime you want. Yeah. So Alan went back and I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's amazing, though, that uh, Alan picked out just those few a, notes. A few notes. And could hear it, uh -huh, could hear what was going uh -huh. on. He said that's it's magical. <laughs> wow. Wow. So then what happened? How did you, you just uh, stayed with Blood for a while? Yeah, yeah. I stayed, he had a loft, and they had, you know, a little cot. I lay down in the cot, and they had another guy named Billy Patterson. They called him Spaceman. And Warren Bimbo was the drummer. Yeah, yeah. They had another drummer too. Oh boy, I can't remember his name. I think he's in Europe. And um, Blood had two bands with the same people. Right. I'm, I'm still thinking on that drummer's name. Right. Uh, one was, was the American Revelation Music Band. Uh huh. And the other one was, I think it was called the Funk Connection. Okay. And we used to practice every single day. Right. So, like, what year would this have been? This is around 1976, somewhere around there. Okay. I know last time we talked to Calvin Weston about his work with Blood, but I'm pretty sure that was after this. This was he, he yeah, played with him later. After. Yeah. So this was really early on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, um, uh, were you gigging with Blood then before you went with Ornette? Yeah. yeah. And through Blood. Yeah, yeah, we were gigging, and the way Blood had his loft set up, I don't know, all kind of musicians used to come there like, like he was a guru or something like right, that. Right. I mean, different musicians coming, known ones too. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, they met me, and other people just start calling me for gigs, like Louis Redman, and Frank Lowe, and Philip Wilson, and Olu Dura, and right. um, Arthur Blythe, and um, Leon Thomas. And it just branched out. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you um, get the call to go with Ornette? Well, I was staying with Blood. And Blood was, um, you know, like a scientist with the music, yeah. him and, and Mr. Coleman. Yeah. Uh, so Blood was doing this thing called modulations, which came through Mr. Coleman. Right. But Mr. Coleman would say homilotics. Right. Blood said modulations. So being that I was playing with blood so much, something happened to Coleman's bass player, Mr. Coleman's bass player. And he said, I'm going on a tour and I want you to come. Right. And he gave me a bunch of melodies to study and we rehearsed them and off we went. Interesting. So I'm thinking, I was thinking you were the first prime time bass player, but you gotta ask blood who that first, first, Prime time bass player. Right. We got to track, track down who that was. Who it was, yeah, yeah. I think he joined a church or something like that. Yeah. And he didn't want to play that type of music Right, anymore. right. That's interesting. Um, all right, so this was um, right as he was getting ready to go on tour, though. So mm -hmm. you didn't really have a chance to rehearse with him too much. Well, or is he, that right? He, he came over to the loft uh -huh. and, you know, with his little funny high pitched voice. Well, Fred. I want you to play the electric bass, but I want you to stand next to me. And I don't want you to play the bass like a role, like everybody else plays. Yeah. I want you, to, I'm playing the saxophone, play it like you're my trumpet player, and learn all of these melodies. Yeah. And then with the, with the homilotics and, and, and the modulations, that took care of, you know, the, the meat of the music. Right, right. But I had to learn all of his melodies. Right. And so then, that's tricky, right? Huh? I said that's tricky, right? Not really, because it's, it's more or less, you know, I can't say it scientifically or on right, paper, right. but it's more or less close to the same thing, because blood was learning from, from Mr. Coleman. Oh, right, right. You know, he was studying right. with Mr. Coleman for a long time. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, I noticed in that uh, there's a video on YouTube mm -hmm. of you playing with him, and um, this was really before Jamal Adin Takuma or Al McDowell were in the band. You really are filling that role of playing more than holding down the bottom. It's like you, you really are on the front line there with him, yeah. playing melodically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, at the time, that was, that was pretty uncharted territory. So, I mean, uh, 
did it help that there were two drummers in the band with two bass drums going, you know, holding down the bottom to actually, free you up? Or? Actually, I guess it helped the, um, the sound that Mr. Coleman wanted. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't bother me a bit because um, Donato plays one way and Shannon Jackson plays another way. Yeah. And Bern Nix plays one way and James Blood Elmer, he plays another way. Right. My main concern is satisfying what Mr. Coleman asked me to do. Right. To play these melodies with me and then do the homilotics and the modulations and then we'll go back to it. Right, right. And it worked out fine. Right. It worked out fine. Did you find any difference between the work you'd done with Blood and then with Ornette, uh, uh, did you, when he asked you for certain things, did you think, oh, this is very familiar because this is what I've done with, with Blood? Was, or, or is it more like, oh, well, this is the same thing, but he's coming at it from a different angle? Uh, I would say it's, it's more like the same thing. Yeah. Because, you know, Blood learned from Mr. Coleman. Right. So it's, it's more or less the same thing. Right. Only thing that uh, Mr. Coleman's you know, I, some people might say melody. I call it the theme. Yeah. Uh, people got different names for it. Right. But let's say the melody uh -huh. of, the, of, of, of the tune that we're going to play. Blood's melodies was, you know, different uh -huh. than Mr. Coleman's. Right. But the meat of the music, like, you know, when it's time to solo, and well, actually, you're not soloing. Like, solo means you're playing <laughs> something by yourself. Right, right. But um, when, when you start improvising, it's, it was more or less the same thing I could say, yeah. Right, right. So, what was the biggest adjustment you felt like you had to make from playing traditional bass? That I had to play all of the melodies. Yeah, yeah. You know? Right. And then I wasn't playing like, like Mr. Coleman said, the bass roll, you know, like right, the boom, right. boom, boom to the bottom. Right. All the time, you know, I could do it. Right. But he said, no, play like you, you know, like in my trumpet player. Right. So from learning all the melodies, that gave you the motivic material to work with when you were improvising, when you yeah. were doing the modulation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In other words, uh, if, we play, if we play a melody right. or a theme, uh -huh. when it's time to improvise, I'm improvising from that theme itself. Right. It might sound, you know, like a little different to the regular ear, yeah. but I'm, I'm improvising from that theme. And then it goes back to the theme, and then the song is finished, or uh -huh. the piece is finished. Right, right. And then when he starts the next one, he has a different theme. And then when it gets into the meat of the music, I improvise on that theme. Uh -huh. so, every, so all of it sounds different to me. Right. So how long was the tour you did with him? I can't really remember, but it seemed like, you know, some weeks. Yeah, yeah. So you were out for a while. Yeah. I mean, were you able to gauge the music growing, shifting some over that course of time? Uh, I wouldn't say it really shifts because every time you play something, it comes out different anyhow. Yeah. yeah. You know, you could say it's going to be this way. We're right. going to do it that way. But when you get on a stage, unless you're playing like Stella by Starlight, then right, it comes right. out the same way. Right. But when you're doing that type of music, it's always going to come out different. Right. You know? All right, so then, uh, so when you got back, um, did you leave New York then? Is that when you went back to Berkeley? Yeah, that's when I went back okay. to Berkeley. I, I took the money right. and went, came back to the building. All right, so you've um, stayed in touch with, with James Blood though, right? Oh yeah, oh right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I used to go so, back. Right. You know, in fact, I went back after I finished what I was doing with Berkeley. All right, so you, you went back and played with him some more then? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and we played way after that too. So I know you're from St. Croix, mm -hmm. and that you uh, there's some uh, really nice videos of a concert that you did uh, where you brought James Blood down to St. Croix to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, mm -hmm. those are very nice. I recommend people look those up. Yeah, uh, that was a nice thri uh, trio. Yeah. Trio. <laughs> right, and uh, you were speaking about the drummer Hugh Peterson. Uh, right? Yeah, right, a right. lot of people know him from Boston too, because he, he and Kenwood Bernard. Oh yeah, who yeah. was very famous here in Boston, and Hugh Peterson they called him Fuma. Ah. So you had Hugh Peterson, Kenwood Denard, and Tom McCampbell. Oh yeah, yeah. And Peyton Crosley. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember Tom McCampbell from when I was there. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah so he was and they had there. another one too, uh, Marvin Smitty Smith. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. I think he was. Um, 
slightly after my time. Oh, okay. That's good. So, uh, anything else when you went back to play with uh, with James Blood again? Was it um, uh, had he moved on to somewhere different? Was it just we're picking right back up where we left off? Or? Well, he's all his music is is always moving sure. on, right? But then what happens? At least with me personally, if I'm playing with somebody, I try to compliment what they want, you know, what they want in their music. So in other words, if, if I'm, when I was playing with Lester Bowie, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do all of these modulations and homilotics and stuff because he was doing something different at Perfect. that particular time. You know, when he, when he was doing the stuff with Chicago Art Ensemble, I wasn't in the band. Right, right. That would have been more suitable for the homilotics. But what right, he right. was doing when I was playing with him, I said, okay, well, this is the way you want it. I'll do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. So did you uh, find that uh, the stuff that you learned, these modulations, working mm -hmm. with blood and all that, did those come in handy on these other gigs? How did that affect your playing with other artists? Uh, yeah, it came in handy because I learned another concept. Yeah. You know, because I was pretty young. Right, right. And in the islands, I was playing Calypso and Latin and yeah. stuff like that and Cool and the Gang. So it was just a whole different concept. And um, I think that's the most important thing when you're playing with, you, when you're playing with somebody. Right. Just like I'm going to play with you in a little while. Mm -hmm. And we sat down over mm -hmm. dinner. Mm -hmm. And my main question is, um, Dave, what kind of concept do you want? Yeah. You know, do you want me to play the melody? Do you want me to play like a background sound? And um, whatever you ask me to do, right. I'll try my best to do it. Right, right. But yeah, I talk to students about that sometime, about that thing of, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll have a question like, how am I gonna use this to earn a living? What is this uh -huh. gonna be good for? Right. Because I tell them sometimes, if they're not used to playing in like a, a freer context, mm -hmm. I tell them I'm giving them solutions for problems they don't have yet, you know? Right, right, So uh, I always say that you can use this on any kind of gig. Yeah. If you're a classical musician, you can use it mm -hmm. because it opens you up, gives yeah. you a different perspective from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is just melodic playing. So yeah. you really learn how to concentrate on the line and the construction and shape of the line. And mm -hmm and how to listen and interact with the other musicians. So it's, so yeah, it's it good for you. Oh yeah, it Can't is. Can't do anything but help you. That's right, that's right. <laughs> it's good to have no different concepts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, anything else from, uh, from your time, uh, from that short tour that, uh, uh, that you remember or that saying about, you know, just his, his conception of the band, because that was, uh, you were really early on there. Those were just in those, those founding days of when he was really getting that, that concept together and what he wanted to do with the electric group. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things that, that stuck in my head while we was on tour, you know, like when we eating breakfast or whatever like right. that, uh, he's the first person that I met in New York that, that heard about my father. He oh, said, right. I, I knew about Aldo Williams with that big Latin jazz calypso band. Yeah. And he said, you came from a different kind of culture. You didn't come from down south. Well, St. Croix is really further south. <laughs> but you know what I mean by yeah. that. He said, you came from a different culture. So I want you to take your culture. We're going to play the, the theme or the melody, however you want to say it. And then when we start improvising, he wants me to improvise like my culture, like my father. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah, gave yeah. me a lot of freedom to be myself. <laughs> yeah, no, that's beautiful. And the thing is, he could turn around, give me the freedom to be myself, mm -hmm. and somehow his conception was big enough to accommodate all of it, you know? Right, right, that's and true. So that's really something that I, I struggle mm -hmm. to, to try to live up to, you know? I mean, just a, a, a good example for us and a good example for the world, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing. Oh, well, Fred, thank you so much. All right. I'm looking forward to tonight. And, okay. Um, Thanks for giving us a little inside glimpse into, into historical times here, mm -hmm, man. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Omer, if you watch that, Fred told me he wasn't gonna tell any tales out of school, so we tried to, to be good, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right.